It's awesome to be with all of you guys. And uh, what I want to talk about is what we're doing here, which is collective genius. I guess what I want to talk about is it's in the collective genius of all of us that we could probably solve almost everything because people are amazingly talented. And we have an opportunity because we never had an internet before until now. We've had networks and other forms where we really are connected and we're beginning to be connected at a whole other level. So we can elevate the collective genius and passion of anybody. And there are doers everywhere. We named our company Shift7 because it means and, if you type it. But we could shift to 7 billion colleagues. And the first thing I want to notice is the mountains. Look at the mountains. It's so beautiful here. If you have a chance, try to watch the best math teacher on the internet. Her name is Vi Hart, V-I-H-A-R-T. And she talks about the Fibonacci sequence and spirals. And she'll explain the mathematics of everything you see. A friend of mine's two-year-old who saw it now calls pine cones achis because she understands Fibonacci at two years old. That's an amazing thing because mathematics is just the language of our universe. So the thing that I wanted to note is that our biggest challenge is this. Look, what did the Dalai Lama say? The fear of being unneeded. That's driving the elections everywhere. People are afraid of the future as well as excited for the future. And the afraid part is really, really destructive. And why would we want to leave everyone out? Like, there's a lot to do. We've got a hell of a lot to do. And I don't want to do it all, and I don't think you guys do. I think we want everybody to do this together, right? What could we do about that? We also have very dangerous mathematics operating, as well as very good mathematics operating. We do have weapons of math destruction. So today, when we run an election, I can fully profile any of you. 5,000 data points. And I know if you voted or not, what did you vote for, what did you do? And I can do propaganda at you right through your screen. And that's happening in every election around the world, not only by the campaigns themselves, who figure out to use this, but also by actors who would disrupt. For example, the KGB used to disrupt Martin Luther King. They'd like to muck with American society, make us fight. So now they're coming through our screens, right? And that's happening around the world. So this is a problem. Uh, Joy Bulam Winnie was on stage. Did anybody see Joy today? Amazing. She's going to speak in the main session, thank God. She has the Algorithmic Justice League. You know, last time I checked, my phone was pretty freaking racist. Have you ever taken a picture of somebody? If they're white, it doesn't have to be adjusted. But if they're not white, you have to look at, balance it. Who the heck thought of that? Why do airbags kill some people? We got to include everyone on the design side, right? And algorithms matter. This is interesting. I won't go into details of it, but if you have a chance to watch it, it shows the American Congress. They used to vote together. Over here, see the grayscale? They're voting together. Doesn't matter which party's in charge. But by the time we get to Fox News and CNN fighting with each other, dividing us, and then we get in here, all of the different cable networks are fighting with each other, and then the internet, wow. We just don't talk to each other, and we're in these media silos, and we can't hear each other. That's kind of a weapon of math destruction that we didn't mean to do. What could we do? What could we invent? What could we do with the internet to fix that? This is interesting. This is, uh, how many people go to the movies? Watch movies? Yeah. When we watch movies, children's movies, this is men's lines to women's lines in children's movies. So when we grow up, we learn, well, men speak more and women speak less, so why don't we make this? This is 2,000 movies, men to women. Should we train the data set on this? I don't think so. So we've got all this bad data that's imbalanced, that's biased, and we've got to fix it. And one of the ways you can do that is just bring more voices forward. This is a good example that uh, some USC folks did. They're just measuring voice in who speaks in Star Wars. So over here, that's Star Wars in 1977. So this is by gender, who speaks? So that's Carrie Fisher's lines. This is by race. And now these are the new movies. So we're getting better. But it was interesting to show this to some of the teams who have made these movies, and they thought they had done better, and they wanted to do better. But it was hard, because they grew up in the same place we did. So none of us created this problem, but we live in it. So what might we do? So here's an example. OK, see how face recognition is recognizing the actor? So we can use face recognition and natural language processing. We can use Alexa and Siri type technologies to analyze our media in the script room 
or in the dailies and realize, am I, did I mean for these people to talk little and these people to talk lots? So there's a lot of opportunities. Why don't we use AI and data science and machine learning for equality? Over here, this is Grace. Grace is in 10th grade. She's teaching the chief of police from New Orleans how to code. And she's in high school and it's not boring because she's working on justice data as part of her learning and she's fixing her city together. And so all of these cities in the United States are now connected in a community of practice where the different people are doing data-driven justice, police data initiative. We have data sets like use of force data, officer involved shooting, et cetera. We can dive into that and we can include our high schoolers and it'll be fun for them to help solve very hard problems. We can hack the pay gap. The pay gap, do you know that uh, one of the cities, I'm trying to say which city, is doing a retro pay. They're getting half, half a million dollars, like $500 million, paying back people from 2006. Uh, and so they're going to have a lot more money in the economy. You could do VR to help you with negotiations to stop managing people that have a pay gap or not accidentally causing pay gaps, right? There's lots of things. This uh, e-commerce site, it just changes the price if you declare your gender or race. We did a hackathon for foster care. There's a lot of AI for precision medicine, but not so much for foster care. But why? Why don't we use it for anything? It's a good way to do it. This is from the hackathon. You know, Jane Addams. How many people ever heard of Jane Addams? Like three or four. Jane Double D. Addams. President Lincoln used to say to her father, my favorite Double D. Addams. She was very famous. She created the whole house. It was a settlement house. They did all kinds of things in the middle of industrial age Chicago. 2,000 people a day. She won the Nobel Prize for inventing social work. She used an awful lot of data. This is some of the data about everybody. So they did perfect city science on livelihood, preschool, arts. So we have had this in the past, but we forgot. We've had chemists. One of the greatest chemists was the first graduate of MIT, who was a woman, Ellen Swallow Richards, who used data science to begin what is the science and data science of water and sewage treatment, et cetera. Very important lost history person. If we know she exists, the further back you can look, the further forward you will see and we'll realize that everybody belongs and everybody can work together to solve problems. I want to invite my colleague Susan Alsner onto stage. Susan uh, is one of my co-founders in Shift 7 and uh, she was at the UN when we met. And so I wanted her to share with you a little bit about the Sustainable Development Goals. I worked at the UN and I worked to help stakeholders to participate in the negotiations and I've been sitting here all day trying to figure out how to map that to a discussion about AI, blockchain, machine learning, etc. And I started thinking about how when the UN was negotiating the Sustainable Development Goals, I ended up in the extraordinary position of having to help design how stakeholders would contribute to this agenda. Originally, historically, in the General Assembly, there's no rules of procedure or protocols or allowances for stakeholders to contribute. But because this was supposed to be the, quote, most inclusive agenda the world had ever seen, the UN said, how can we do this differently? So the method or the analog algorithm for how stakeholders would contribute was really important. And the data set that was going to feed into the ultimate outcome of that agenda, what should that data set be? Should it be just governments? Should it be just the ambassadors and their delegations? Or should it be the people of the world who are affected by how the policies are created, how the, the ultimate implementation of the agenda? Shouldn't those people who are going to be most affected by this, wouldn't they have relevant expertise? They're living these realities. Shouldn't they be part of that data set? So it was a huge challenge to negotiate this, but we did achieve it. We were able to get people into the negotiating sessions for three hours per week with the governments, formally part of it, to feed in their input, and even be able to edit in Google Docs the draft texts. So the data input to achieve the SDGs was more thorough. Now, I just want to raise a point because I think this goes to everybody who's out there designing AI and machine learning and, and all of this technology. There was a big pushback even from some stakeholders themselves that say refugees and migrants or others who had never been to the UN didn't belong there because they weren't experts. But what we found is the governments consistently got more out of the inputs from those people who had never been to the UN before than those who had been visiting every single day and had a job to do so. And I want to give one example now of a success before we move on. This is Kathy Jetnil Kijiner. She's from the Marshall Islands. She's 26 years old. She was the head of a three-person NGO, a teacher, a journalist, and a mother of a six-month-old baby. 
She was selected through a public process to address the opening ceremony of the Climate Summit in 2014, which preceded the Paris Agreement of 2015. She had never been to the UN before. When I told her she was selected, she said she was terrified. But she came to the UN, and she delivered a poem, and she got a standing ovation. It was headline news around the world, Climate po Summit Poet Moves World Leaders to Tears. And now, fast forward to this year, and she's one of only 21 Obama Fellows for the Pacific to help us reach a sustainable world. So I want to give it back to Megan to talk about what else we did with UN Solution Summit, which was a follow-on of starting to bring entrepreneurs who had already solved for the SDGs to come to the UN and help decision makers understand how to create an enabling environment for them so we can move faster and achieve these goals at scale on time. Thanks, Susan. So this is an example where you just put up a web page at the UN and you say, who already has solutions for these SDGs? We got more than 1,000 submissions from 134 countries in two days. I mean, it was amazing to see what everybody's already doing. And if you ask, you get. There's a group flying drones to plant a billion trees a year. This group teach law, teaches law in prison in Uganda and 1,000 people get themselves out. That's a justice goal. She is a princess mechanical engineer in Burkina Faso doing solar lighting. This is one of my favorites because I'm a mechanical engineer. This is a floating fabrication lab for the Amazon. So we can either cut down all the trees or the people who work there, live there, could have a job in advanced manufacturing on a boat off of, in the river, bringing their bio-informed indigenous genus knowledge and start doing this kind of work. This is actually happening. It's an entrepreneur from the Amazon doing that work. And there's fab labs and innovation spaces all over the world for what people would invent. Standing Rock, Pine Ridge. Pine Ridge is one of the bottom 10 counties in the country in the United States. These are Native American entrepreneurs, so instead of being a program at them, you could just ask, hey, what are you doing in water and environment and agriculture, and see what comes back. And so MIT asked, and we got 22 submissions, and these are six of the fellows. Henry Redcloud pops this onto your house and drops your heat cost by a third. Rose is doing those most incredible organic gardening. So these are entrepreneurs like Jeff Bezos and, and Mark Zuckerberg who never get a venture capital economy around them. So why don't we do that? Why don't we ask? Why don't we use the internet? And why don't we include them in the collective genius? New kinds of urban design coming out of the, the, the Dakotas with the Oshede Shakone Great Sioux Nation Native Americans. Uh, you know, the children, this is the kids who win the science fair. There's a now movie about them. You know, this little girl saw this in her neighborhood, and so she started merging the water and getting her friends to come too. So the young people, their high school can change into solving the SDGs with us. And so that's what we can do. These kids can become active science tech artists, writers, and work with us. There's as many open STEM jobs as people in prison. And every time we teach tech in prison, we get 7% recidivism, and if we don't, we get like 70. People come back because they need skills and they need confidence. And so we went all over the United States on a tech jobs tour. And so we're getting the techies in town who are quite invisible to meet their colleagues. You're trying to get employers to hire from the new no-collar boot camps, three months to learn to code. We have 23,000 Americans graduating from coding boot camp this year, 46,000 undergrads. Mayors know and techies welcome them. So this is Cleveland and we do speed mentoring. This is Memphis, speed mentoring. This is Oakland where we had 2,000 people show up to try to get into the tech sector in Silicon Valley. You think they're invited, but they're not, so they need an on-ramp. So we're all over the country and we can do things like this. There's also innovation centers all over the world. And we can solve things this way. This happens to be Memphis. They even have a container ship with a STEM boot camp at the playground where the kids go and fly stuff and dance and learn to code. This is Appalachia. Coal miner entrepreneurs founded this company, BitSource. They advertised and said, first thing we'll do is we'll learn to code and then we're going to reshore jobs. So we can include everyone because 800 people applied for 12 jobs. This is in Idaho. This is in Buffalo, where I'm from. The river used to be on fire and now there's a solar city plant going in here. We can transform our world. And the good news is that everybody's already doing that. That's Gaza. Do you see pictures like that of Gaza? That's Boise, Idaho meetups. One of them has 800 people. That's Afghanistan. So there are these people who are techies in all these places. This is the US, but they're all over the world. Systems are kind or cruel depending on who you are. And we can use AI and technology 
not just for precision medicine and self-driving cars and robotics, which is great. We can also use it for justice and equality and agriculture and inclusion and humanitarian things. So that we have things like, we don't have burning men with one system and Zatari refugee camp with another. This one self-actualizes you and this is, feels very prison-like because you can't move. But we have entrepreneurial people. They came for sad reasons, they came for fun reasons, but the system really needs to upgrade here to the 21st century. Last thing, when we were with President Obama, we used to do a science fair. And we have all the kids in the White House. These kids are from Oklahoma. He's coming up, what'd you guys do? We made a page turning robot. He said, how'd you guys do that? He said, we had a brainstorming. Then he says, okay, and then what'd you do? We built some prototypes. So what if all of us, when we were this age, not only dressed up in capes, hung out with our friends, solved the SDG problems on something we were interested in and did brainstorming and prototypes. And that every kid in the world got to have a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, right? Like they get in the UK from second grade. And we could do these things together. And we would know that Ada Lovelace invented AI at the same time Darwin wrote. And I'll tell you something funny about her hair. She looks like someone we know. That two people, that two people did the work around uh, the first heart surgery, but the black man had to stand here as a doctor because he couldn't touch the patient. That Ida was the first Black Lives Matter data scientist and wrote the amazing work around solving problems. Tesla got to be loud and Ida was quiet, but they wrote work all about wanting to have an exhibit hall at the Chicago World's Fair and they were never allowed. So the African American people who invented all this stuff were never seen just like they're never seen at CES. So I'll finish with these 13 year olds who are doing amazing work on gaming and also on listening to the room for domestic violence. So if we accelerate all the kids, we can solve almost everything. And if we include everyone, rather than try to do all tech in quarter to include, why don't we just include everyone and let them do their thing? So Collective Genius, thank you, and congrats on this amazing day. Congrats to John and the team. Thank you.